just double check here, but it should be fine. Yeah, and then make sure that this is coming up. Working. So when you're ready to go, you can un unmute it. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, uh, discussing uh, Pat's role with him up here, he does a lot of things related to data, uh, not only working with data and systems, but also as far as um, um, how he's supporting the data community here at Salt Lake and probably even more broadly in, in the West. Anyway, uh, I'll let Pat then describe what he does during the day and at night and on the weekends because it's all sort of related to data. Uh, he's also got a few announcements to make related to uh, how you folks might even get more engaged with the, the, the communities around big data, data science, and Salt Lake if you're interested in many other things. So thanks for coming, okay. Pat. Thanks, okay. Michael. Um, thanks. So what's the official class? Data warehousing. Data warehousing. Okay. So let me just make sure I understand my audience a little bit. How many people know who Ralph Kimball is? Okay. How about Bill Inman? Okay, a little bit here and there. Okay. ETL. Everybody knows what ETL means? Okay, good. Good. You've taught him well. That's good. Dan Taylor ETL. Ah, I see. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about today, though, is some relational database stuff and the data warehousing blender, as I call it. Um, there's a big revolution in the world of relational databases right now and data in general, and anybody can tell me what that is. It's the one word everyone seems to talk about in marketing every day. Big data. Thank you. I love that. I love that everybody knows what big data is. Big data is a buzzword. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants it. So let's get right started. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into a deep technical presentation, but I really want a lot of great questions from everybody. I'm going to describe the environment I live in right now and what things are coming up in the future as well. So I'd really love to hear the things that you're looking for and what you want to hear about. Okay? Here's a little bit about me really quick. I really, really don't like to talk about me, so I'm going to stay on this for a very brief second. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, about 12 years. I volunteer all the time. I'm president of Utah Geek Events. I um, was a past board member. I um, started the SQL Server users group, all sorts of fun things like that. So I'm really connected into the community. Uh, we are putting on an air quality competition that I will talk about here at the end, bigdatautah.org. Wonderful, wonderful competition going on right now. Okay, so why is everybody talking about big data? Can anybody tell me why it's such a big buzzword now in this day and age? Yes? I think we've got more data than we ever had before. We have more data than we ever had before. That's a good answer. Anybody else? Yes? People are trying to figure out how to handle it and how to store it. Okay, so first of all, we had big data problems in 1972. It was called a 1.44 floppy disk. Okay? When they wanted to store a 5 meg file, how could they do it? They couldn't. That's a big data problem way back then. So big data is not something new. It's something I like to say we failed at. And why did we fail? Because we took too long to do normal data warehousing things. It took too long to put together an enterprise data warehouse or take all that time to do it. So people started doing big data tools to get around that time and that performance. So people started learning about the right tool for the job. Big data is all about the right tool for the job. It's not just about one tool that you have available. Um, how many people love SQL Server? Okay, nobody in particular, a little bit. Oracle? Thank goodness nobody raised their hands. Nothing against Oracle. Um, MySQL. Okay. So a lot of different things. These are all tools, relational database tools that are out there. And what people tried to do is they tried to take data warehousing and put it into these tools, whether it was the right tool or not. They wanted to get it in there. They wanted to use the tools they already had, and they wanted to move forward with those tools. Unfortunately, they were the wrong tools for the job. So now we have people talking more and more about big data and big data solutions. So the data warehousing took too long. It wasn't the right tool for the job. It cost too much. So where you're standing right now, where, where Michael mentioned you're in data warehousing technologies. That's what you guys are learning about right now. In the, in the business world out there, I've done several data warehouses. And most of those data warehouses took from two to three years to complete. And that's just not fast enough for business. They typically want something in six months, 90 days, one year, something like that. 
They need a faster turnaround time. So these tools are the things that help you to get to that point. Okay? Uh, it was not flexible, too. Um, how many people know the Kimball method? I kind of asked that earlier. An ETL process, what does it take to change a star schema? Nobody? It takes a lot to change a star schema, okay? It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of work to do those changes. When you have that much changes to do, it makes the process very slow. So, and you couldn't scale without lots and lots of money. Data warehousing costs lots and lots of money. Enter big data that changed all of this. All right, so what is big data? As I mentioned, in 1972, we had a big data problem. This was big data back then. It was an entire room full of computers. Now we can hold these things on our phones with this much size and this much data. And as you mentioned, there's a lot more data coming up in the world now. But that's not the only problem that big data that solves. This is my favorite quote of all time recently about big data. Big data is like teenage sex. Everybody is talking about it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they are doing it. Okay? This is 100% the truth. I, I honestly will tell you right now, this is 100% the truth. Every large company you go to right now, go down the list of Fortune 500, they'll say they have some sort of big data solution. And this may be nothing more than 10 terabytes of data sitting in a Hadoop cluster, but I guarantee you they'll say they have a, 10, they have a big data solution. And do they really? Well, that's to be debated. Okay, so what really is big data? What is it that we're really talking about here? It's not just about size, okay? It's not just about the size of the data. It's about the volume of the data. How much of it do you have? Where is it going? The variety of the data. The different types that you can have. Unstructured, structured, uh, XML, PDF files, all sorts of things. All variety of the data. And it's about the velocity and how much is going through your system at one time. So big data is not just about having 30 petabytes sitting around somewhere. That's that's a big data problem, but it's not the only problem. What I'm going to show you here in a minute with my company, our largest database is 800 gigs. That's it, 800 gigs. And we've put a big data solution in place that saved a lot of money and a lot of time, but we don't have too much data. If you go to a very large company, say somebody like Goldman Sachs, they have over 30 petabytes of data. That's a big data problem as well. But it's not just about the size of the data that matters. Okay. Questions on big data in general, what you're hearing right now. I'd love to hear if somebody says, you know, no, I hear about this in big data or this about in big data. Anything that you hear lately on big data, questions? No, not a, not a talkative group tonight. <laughs> I guess I need to wake everybody up or something. I should have brought candy bars to throw. I always forget to do that. <laughs> okay, the last part of this big data thing is this is, the reason I talk about 1972 is this is an old idea with new concepts and new tools. I'm sorry, new tools. Because they had this problem back then. They solved it in different ways. They split apart the disks. They, they split apart the floppy drives. They made software that ran in those smaller amounts. They solved these problems. But now we have new tools, much better tools, much faster tools that make this so much more of a reality. OK? Yes, sir. So would you recommend using a uh, quote unquote big data solution for a small to medium sized startup? OK, so the question was, what I recommend using a big data solution for a small to medium sized startup. What I would recommend is using the right tool for the job to solve whatever the customer needs to do for that um, small to medium startup. Does that mean it's a big data tool? Sure, it could be Hadoop. Hadoop's a common big data buzzword that everybody uses. Could be MySQL, it could be SQL Server. All of them can be big data tools, and all of them can do what you're asking them to do. You just gotta find the right tool for the job. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Would you like the question more? Well, that's the thing is it was a big question, so it, it gave the big answer. Yeah, well, the answer is, the answer simply is, you have to use the right tool for the job. If someone right now brought me off the street and said, well, I'm not on the street, but somebody brought me off the street and said, design us a reporting system that does X, I would use the right tool for the job to design that reporting system. Whether that was big data, whether that was MySQL, whether that was Oracle, no matter what that was, 
you have to use the right tool for the job. Do you think that the Pareto principle applies here to where 20% of the tools will fix 80% of the problems? The Pareto principle, does that apply here where 20% of the tools will fix 80% of the problems? Um, there's a good possibility that would apply. Um, in this day and age, with how many tools are out there in the big data space, I would say, yeah, there's a good chance of that. But I would also say that you're still going to go down some tool paths that you're not going to want to go down. Um, things that are very complicated, such as a Cassandra or something else, that might take you more than if you were to go to something simple like a Hadoop. So, yeah, could you use many of the tools to do the same thing? Yes. What I suggested? No. I would suggest doing the due diligence and finding out which one is the right tool. Is that a question? Yes. So what are some of the factors? I know it depends on the requirements, but what are, do you have any uh, list of factors or things that you take into consideration to determine which solution you're going to provide? I mean, what are some things that you look at? It depends on the common answer. Do I have a, so the question was, do I have a list of factors or common things that I look at to provide a solution? Yes. Absolutely. We look at cost going forward. What is the scalability? How much data are we talking about? What kind of performance is needed. We also look, one of the most important things you'll find is that let's say you're not a startup. Let's say you're coming into an existing company. You have to look at the technology that's already there. That makes a huge difference. And I'll show you here on my architectural slide. It makes a huge difference if there's data and company, there's data and code that is already in place. So scalability, um, do I have rough numbers? No, because it's different for every situation. But definitely cost. Definitely how far is this going to scale? How much can we predict we already know we're going to get? Are we going to get three petabytes in a year? Are we going to get five gigs in a month? You know, what is the number that we're going to try to get? And some of those can be predicted, some cannot. So does that answer the question? It does. It's just the comments that you made as far as how many other things we're going to go with data mm -hmm. I can see depending on what your requirements are, you can also go with your server or Oracle or whatever you choose. It yep. depends what, how it has to grow yep. and all of them. Yeah, and I'll show you on this architectural slide exactly why I chose what I did. And it was a SQL Server to Big Data solution. So other questions on Big Data in general? Yes, sir? You say you want to use the right tool for the right job. Well, what if you have multiple jobs and that one right tool for the last job doesn't apply to the next? How do you manage? How do you manage lots and lots of tools? Yes. Okay, so the last guest speaker says he left his previous job because they had so many different tools. That's so. So the question is, how do you manage so many tools out there, you have essentially tool sprawl, or too many things going on at once? I can agree with Danny in a lot of cases that if you've got too many different tools going on, you've got a serious problem. Um, a perfect example, a company I worked for was a and Labs, right up here, over here at the university. We had over, I think, 120 applications inside to run our corporate system. 120 different coded applications to do what they do every day. That's too many. That's too many tools running around. Um, the best way to manage it or to handle it is you know, segmenting it out into different sections so that certain people work on certain sections, and then someone understands the overarching of all of it and how it works together. Or maybe it doesn't work together at all. Basically, the, the short answer that I can give you is that there's no good one answer to that. I mean, Danny's right. If that's a frustrating aspect, you have to consider something else. If I'm starting from the ground up with a startup company or something like that, you're going to want to keep those tools to a minimum so that you don't have too much complexity. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I would, I would like to uh, industry is sometimes you can jump into tools some other rationale other than, like, you know, we've got 70% overlap. You really have to have quite a <coughs> Small overlap and tools can be up to the end of the And but then there's other parts where you think they can assume you refuse to add new technology because you really take certain follow up and apply. So it's it probably like another 820 yes. kind of for a for you can use like two systems to solve them the problems, right? You know, they, and that's what we see from the high uh NATO or other thing on that side. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many times that I've come into a company that's had way too many applications or tools for what they need to do. 
and they need to consolidate down. And then you get the opposite of that spectrum too, where they have one hammer to hit every nail, no matter what. There's one back-end database system and nothing else, and everything is written. So how do you get the happy Is that just experience? That is experience, yes, that's experience. I would say that's the happy medium is much more than just the technology. It's the people, it's the culture, it's the team. It's more about the company overall to, to bring that together. And you'll find also in larger companies, you have no choice. I mean, again, Goldman Sachs, one of my favorite examples, they are a bank, right? I mean, that's what they are. But in all respect, they are a technology company. They have over 3,600 employees that are nothing more than technology. Engineers, developers, web people, the whole nine yards. So that right there, they are a technology company. They have thousands of apps running around. There's no happy medium that they can reach there to make that the same. So it really depends on what type of company you go into. I can suggest if you're a startup, if you're small, try to keep it simple. Use what tools work well for you. And then as you grow, you'll have to expand that tool. That answer the question. Okay. Any other questions on big data? All right, we'll keep talking about big data, though. Don't worry, most of this is all about it. So I work for a company called Allegiant Software. Allegiant does voice of the customer intelligence. What that means is that we help customers find out what their customers are really saying about them. We want to, we want to help them make better decisions about product support. So how many people here um, use a Fitbit? Or have seen Fitbits, Nike Fitbits. Okay, so we've got a few of them. Um, if you didn't like something about that, you would send in a survey and you'd complain. Those surveys are something that we process through our system. We take that customer feedback, that customer sentiment, we bring it all together, we analyze it, and then we provide it back to our customer and say, this is why Michael did not like his Fitbit. And this is what you can do to make it better. That's what we provide, that's what we do. So we have some varied data sets. Like I said, we're not gigantic. We do not have terabytes and terabytes of data. But we have lots of different varied data and lots of different dynamic questions in our system. So our problem, the problem that we were chosen to solve, or that I was chosen to solve, was slow website performance. It's a simple thing that you see all the time. Someone has written a website. It has lots and lots of filters to filter all this survey data. And it has to query the database directly. So it queries the database, it sends back the query, sends back the results, and you get the results in 30 seconds. Um, sometimes for us, five minutes. <laughs> a little too long. That's the problem that we had to solve, is that we had lots of dynamic queries running against our relational database system, and we need to speed it up. Now, how many people know the benefits of a relational database system? What is it good at versus what is it not good at? A highly normalized relational database. What is it good at? Right, I heard right, transactions, yes. Rights, transactions, getting data into the system. What is it bad at? Getting it out, right. You always have a balance, a pro and con. Something's good at getting in, something's not. So we had to take our relational system and make it run queries very quickly. We had to get that data out quickly. And a normalized database is not the place to do that. So we embarked on several data warehousing projects. And that's what we'll show here. Right now, this is our current architecture. This is how we live. Um, we've already gone to production on what I'm going to show you in a second, so it's not totally current. But we have data coming in from different locations. We have different apps that pull data into our database. So this is the write problem. This is where the writes come in. They come in, they write to the database. That same database has a service that queries the database. We're querying from where we're writing to. Always a bad idea. Don't read from the same place that you write to if possible. And then we return it to our website in the form of a UI that we've created that has filters and SQL queries. Okay? So a customer can go in, say, I want to see these five questions, I want to see this query, and then execute it against the database. That's what it does right now. This ended up being very slow and not scalable. We had one SQL server, so it had to do all the processing. It has to go vertical instead of horizontal. SQL Server typically scales vertical, meaning the more memory and CPU I add to it, the faster it will get and the more disk. But it can only go to a certain ceiling. Um, so that's what we have right now. What we ch tested on, what we tried, is we tried to copy the data, we replicated it off to another SQL Server, and we tried to query it from there. There was a lot of issues with this. Replication <laughs> slowed down. 
got behind, had problems connecting, all sorts of things like that. So there's, and there's a cost factor here. I now have to pay for two of these instead of one. If anybody's done Microsoft licensing, it's not that cheap, okay? The other thing we tried was cubes. How many people have dealt with cubes before? <laughs> Michael's the only one raising his hand. Oh, one more over here. Cubes, what are the beauty of cubes? Who can tell me what's so wonderful and wonder about cubes? Really fast, pre-calculated. Easy to understand, I would completely disagree with that. <laughs> the third dimension is very hard for some people to understand. Well, yeah, I still know a lot of DBAs that have a hard time with cubes. So, um, But yes, they are pre-calculated, they are extremely fast. They return all of your queries very, very quickly. What are their disadvantages? Inflexible, loading and refreshing. Cost. They are not scalable. In SQL Server, in a cube land, you have one cube, essentially, for however many customers you have. In our case, we were a SaaS customer. So we had to have 500, 600 cubes for each customer, one for each customer. That's how we would have had to have designed this. So can you imagine a server that had to house all of these different cubes, holding all of that in memory, holding that all in space? It would have been an extreme cost for all the servers. So we tested this out on one server, and it did not work well, with one customer. It took too long to process, it cost too much, and it never really, it was not flexible at all. So another solution that we tried. Now, as you go out there and, you, and you're looking at other projects and stuff, this doesn't mean that these projects are wrong, replication and cubes. It just means that you have other options available to you as well besides these, okay? I know lots of companies that are still using these perfectly well that work for their solutions. So here's what we came up with for our big data solution. We still have the same data coming in, and we still have our SQL Server. This goes back to the point I made that you can't take away all the technology from something that's been very established. Our product is about was written about five or six years ago. It has a lot of code. We can't just go and rip it out and change it to one whole thing. That would take too much time, so we chose to augment it or enhance it by using a reporting solution. So we take the data out of SQL Server, we put it into Hadoop, into a Hive table. Hive greatly reduces the map reduce time and gives you basically a SQL-like table. How many people have played with Hadoop? Not enough. How many people? Have, so Hadoop is a map reduce system. How many knows what a map reduce system is? Okay, a few. Multiple, massively parallel processing. I hate getting that word out. I don't know why. Massively parallel processing. Does everybody know what that is? Okay, I got some head nods. I'll just make sure that everybody understands. Basically, these nodes down here horizontally scale. So it takes a piece of data, and it works on it on each of these machines. This lab is a perfect example. Let's say we all had Hadoop running on these. We would have a cluster of all of these together. So all of these boxes would work together on pieces of the data, and then they would come back to one piece and get the answer. That is map reduce. You map the data out to all of its pieces, you reduce it, and you bring it back. Okay? Now, that's not really faster when you're talking about something in real time. But in a batch processing system, it's much, much faster. And it's scalable. As soon as I want to add more speed to my cluster, I add more nodes, and it gets faster because I have more workers to process on it. Like if this was a cluster right here in this side of the room, if I wanted to make it faster, I could add the middle section of the room, and that would speed up all of my processing. Okay? Does this make sense, the horizontal scale to it a little bit more? Okay, I've got some head nons. That's good. So SQL Server would be like this podium right here, and it would reach to the ceiling. You'd keep adding memory. You'd keep adding disk. You'd make it very vertical. You'd make it very big. Hadoop would be all of the computers in the room. Okay? Those are the differences, really, between them. So we took our data, we put it inside Hadoop, we made a Hive table out of it, and then we loaded it into another tool called Elasticsearch. Now, Hadoop and Elasticsearch are both open source projects. They're both free. Okay? We had to pay for the hardware of these costs, but no other costs. So Elasticsearch is a search engine based off of solar, I mean, Lucene technology. Anybody know what Lucene is? No, OK. <laughs> Lucene is a search software that's open source. 
Lucene, um, brought around Solar, and then brought around Elasticsearch as well. Basically, things like Google Search, stuff like that, they're all similar to the Lucene solution. And what they do is they take and they make an index of your data, they put it into memory, which is always better, and they spread it across lots and lots of boxes. And they do the same thing, the same MapReduce idea that Hadoop does, basically, and says, go out and find me this data and bring it back. And it makes it very, very fast to query that data. In other words, this is what we call the speed layer inside a big data project. This would be processing, and this would be the speed. Okay, from there, yes, did you have a question? So what is the difference between Elasticsearch and Solar? We started our project about a year and a half ago, and Elasticsearch at the time was the one that had failover capabilities between its nodes. Solar did not. Now, Solar does have a cloud product now that does that, but, excuse me, before they did not. So that was our primary reason that we went with Solar. I mean, Elasticsearch for ours. So uh, they are very, very similar in nature, though. Okay? Yep. Uh, so we go to Elasticsearch. We pull all the data from here. And then we use our same reporting service that I just talked about earlier and our web UI to connect to that Elasticsearch service. Now, this took our queries, instead of taking five minutes in SQL Server, down to milliseconds. Our Elasticsearch alarm right now is on 50 milliseconds. If anything takes over 50 milliseconds, I get an email. I haven't been emailed in months of any of these queries. They don't take that long because we've distributed it and we put it in memory. Uh, memory is always faster than disk. I don't care what anyone says, memory is always faster than disk. So by putting things into memory, you speed it up. Now, I'm sure somebody will ask me the question, and maybe you won't, but why not just put it in memory in SQL Server? Why not just make it faster that way? SQL Server, you can't control what is in memory and what is not. There's certain buffer pools, there's certain things you can do, there's lots of little switches you can make, but you can't just say, take this data and put it in memory and leave it there. It won't do it, okay? You can do that in Elasticsearch. So that's where you can control it, and you can control that a lot more in a fine granularity. Yes? So if you can your reporting service, no, this is a custom reporting service. I've been meaning to rename that slide for ages now. I've done this. I should have said that. I've done this presentation like 10 times, and every time somebody's asked me on that. Um, no, this is a custom reporting service that we created. It's actually called Mock. That's the code name for our service, and that's what does the actual query. You would, you would have to write a connector, or you would have to write something like a JDBC driver. You can do JDBC, so you could use that to connect to it. So, but there'd be some translation. Um, Elasticsearch queries do not look like SQL queries, and that's one of the parts that we processed inside here. So we took our data. An ETL process, a data warehousing process, typically means that you're going to take denormalized database, I mean, sorry, normalized data, you're going to denormalize it, and then you're going to normalize it again. That's a typical data warehousing process. You move it from its normalized state, you put it into a staging table, and then you put it into a cube or a star structure, which is a normalized structure. Okay? What we are doing, essentially, with Hadoop is we are taking the normalized form, we're denormalizing it, but then we're never putting it back into normalized form. We actually move it into a key value pair system that goes into Elasticsearch. And that key value pair is very fast for Elasticsearch to use and to load. So we optimize that for our own situation. And again, that's part of the using the right tool for the job. We could have just taken the data and thrown it into Elasticsearch. It wouldn't have been that much faster unless we transformed it. Yes, sir? So what are the costs or disadvantages of Elasticsearch? The costs and the disadvantage of Elasticsearch. Um, I would say the disadvantage to Elasticsearch is the memory, the memory cost. It, it basically wants to put everything inside memory. Now, memory is relatively cheap. But again, if you're trying to hold, say, petabytes or something, you're going to have a lot of these boxes behind here to hold all of that memory in place. Um, some of the other disadvantages, learning. You have to learn how to use it. You have to know um, how to ma maintain it and manage it. And typically, when you go into one of these open source projects like Hadoop or Elasticsearch, you either have a learning curve or you hire someone that already knows how to do it. I cheated and I hired someone. <laughs> so that's what I did with Hadoop as well. So I learned a lot of this myself. But to get us up and running, we hired a person that knew this very well and then brought it into the system. It took a lot less time. So did that answer your question? Yeah, what I'm looking for is a scenario where Elasticsearch could, I, I mean, except for the cost of memory, it seems like 
kind of a, a big winner. Is there a scenario where Elasticsearch just sucks at? Yeah, absolutely. There would be several different scenarios based on the type of data you throw into it. Um, something like a natural text, or if you start throwing in, say, 10 gig PDF documents or some sort of large document sort of store, that might not be the best situation for it. So <coughs> there's definitely types of data you probably don't want to put inside there. Like I said, if we had taken our normalized, our denormalized data and just threw it up there, it wouldn't have been as fast. We converted it so that it fit the document store that Elasticsearch is designed for. It's about using the right tool in the right situation for the job. So if you took a table from SQL Server and you just published it into Elasticsearch, you're going to get faster because it's in memory, but you're not going to get the true advantage of Elasticsearch. So I guess the easy way to say the disadvantage is you have to convert your data to meet its forms a little better. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I had one over here. Yes? So I was wondering what kind of process you went through um, in order to decide on So you talked about the Did you like spend a couple of weeks? Yeah. Okay, so a couple of questions there. What were some of the process? So the an the question was what was my process to deciding to go with Hadoop and Elasticsearch? Hadoop was kind of given out of the box, and there's a few key reasons. One it's the most common big data solution out there. As far as I'm concerned right now, it's the best batch processor in the market. Just for cost, for usability, for the people that know it, it's simply the tool for batch processing that works really well. So Hadoop was kind of a no-brainer, let's put it that way. It was kind of, we need to move this data like this. We need to do something here. I was very familiar with SSIS. I know it very well. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We can do this in Hadoop, and we can do it this way. And that's what we did and we converted it over. Elasticsearch, the speed layer aspect, we did some research. We looked at React and Mongo and Couch and uh, uh, Redshift and a few others, and we did some couple weeks of research to say what seems like the best way to search with the most distributed architecture, with in-memory, with failover capabilities. So we looked at all of those to decide where we went with that, with that system. And then, of course, the other important factor is how long would it take us to write to this? Elasticsearch is very Java-based. My developers that work on Elasticsearch know Java very well, and so it was a common thing for them to use something like that. So, you know, research, right tool for the job, but those were some of the things we went through. We absolutely went through a process to test and figure that out. Um, I would definitely say, though, if you're looking at a batch process scenario, if you come into a company and they have an SSIS ETL package, that moves from one place to another, Hadoop can replace that very, very easily. It took me less than a month to put this in place, and I've never touched open source before that. Um, I never touched any Linux that much at all or anything, and I put this in place very quickly. Yes, Michael? Well, actually, well, you have some um, when we were doing the reporting, the cubes and everything like that, that's where we used SSIS a little bit, and we have moved it all to Hadoop. We do not do any of those projects anymore. They have all been removed. This is our only reporting solution and the only way we're intending to do it in the future. And we so, chose... So there are some far left are not SSIS? No, those are custom code. Those are custom code. They will probably change in the future, but again, that comes back to when is the right time to do that. Yeah. Um, this piece... Uh, right here is basically just SQL queries. It's using scoop, it's SQL queries. And then to make this hive table, it's all SQL queries as well. And we didn't use pig. You'll hear pig a lot. We didn't use pig because, again, there was more of a learning curve to it. I know T-SQL very well. Hive does SQL very well. So it's very simple to move and to go to that. And you'll find when I talk about what's next and stuff like that, there's so many more tools that are getting used to SQL now. Everybody in the big data space is trying to get SQL-like tools because they want it to be easy to convert over. Yes? So, um, just for my clarification, so you're saying some of the database that you have right there, is that one database gathering all the data from all those multiple operational data sources into there, or is that kind of saving, and then you're putting it into the we have We have one database per customer, and they are all collecting in the same spot, and then we run a process on our database to then pull it over to Hadoop. So does that answer your question? 
Yeah, there's a staging table. There is a staging table. Same as you would have in any ETL data warehousing process. So as you learn ETL data warehousing, I tell people this all the time, even if you learn SSIS or cubes or ETL data warehousing, all of that applies to this. It's no different. It's just different tools. That's all it is. <laughs> Again, I've been doing it for years with those data warehousing, and it did not take me long to, to change this. I just had to understand what each part was good for. This was batch processing, this was speed layer, and then I had the UI on the other side. So that answered the question. Anything else? OK, so we can go back to this, but any other questions on the architecture in general? Yes. It's custom. The reporting service is a custom service that we wrote called Mock that handles all of this. And the website has changed too as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard to say. I know he, um, the guy that wrote the connector between uh, Elasticsearch and our reporting service, or I mean Elasticsearch and Hadoop, um, he open sourced that. He released that on GitHub, but I don't think, this part is not. This belongs to us as our proprietary company information. So that answers the question. You what? Yes, yeah. Yeah, this, right there, this website, Dashboards 2.0, you might have seen, or Spotlight, Spotlight that is about to be connected to this, and it'll move even quicker. But Dashboards 2.0, our newest product, is entirely driven off of this. And it can analyze a lot of data, <laughs> a lot of pieces of data. So, okay. So, the solution. Our solution ended up being highly scalable. If we need to add more nodes to speed it up, we can add more nodes. We can do that in Elasticsearch. We can do that in Hadoop. Our process speeds up anytime we do that. Yes, sir? So one of the things with Hadoop is that you normally have to have a master node yes. in order to break it out and tell the computer where each piece of data is stored. Main yes. Later reflected. So my question is, is it, can you maintain one master node, and is there a limit to that master node? Uh, is there a limit to the master node? Can you maintain one master node? Um, the name node, you can only have one right now. Now, Hadoop 2.0, the latest one that came out, can have multiples. They can fail over. I believe they have a failover situation now. So can you only maintain one? Yes, you can only have one. That's its one failure point. If, the if that goes down, kind of the cluster goes down. But rarely do name nodes go down. <laughs> That's kind of the key behind it, if they rarely go down. Um, can you max it out? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, yes. You mean how many nodes can each one support? Yes, sir. Okay. So the simple answer to that is as many as works for the situation. Um, Facebook, perfect example. Facebook has entire data centers that are one cluster, the whole data center. So all the racks, all the boxes, three or 4,000 machines is one Hadoop cluster. So that's how many they saw fit to use. Yahoo, same thing. This Hadoop came out of Yahoo, 3,000 nodes for one cluster is typically where they're seeing their, their happy medium of what they've been using. We have five, <laughs> so we're not too worried about it. But I see clusters all the time that are 100, 200, things like that. It's really, it really depends on some of the situations you put it in. The biggest problem that people like Facebook have in the really large companies is how do you expand a building? when you have that many boxes. It's not a question of expanding the boxes anymore. It's how do you move a building or make a building bigger? And that's a big problem. <laughs> so they, they actually created some great new technologies that allow you to fail over between clusters. And those are open source, and they're actually out there and available. I can't remember the code name for it, but you can actually fail over to another cluster, because that's how they moved their, I think it was 30 petabytes of data between buildings. So it's a great article. If you want to find it, Facebook um, Hadoop cluster, you'll find it on the web, and it's a wonderful article about it. Yes, sir. Uh, was the question Hadoop is not consistent? Yeah. As for the cap theorem, I mean Hadoop is not consistent. The cap theorem. Yeah. So Hadoop is not consistent. That's yes and no. Um, Hadoop is consistent in that it replicates the data three times. So it doesn't give you an answer back until it's complete with all three of them, essentially. If one of them fails, the next um, desktop picks it up and goes again and gives you back an answer. 
So, but is it real time consistent is probably the better question that you're looking for. And I would say not exactly. I would say it's more batch processing consistent. We use it in a batch of a certain amount of time to run and to give us an answer. When that answer comes back, that is a consistent answer that it's giving us. But at that point in time is really where that consistent answer is. So would I do a lot of real-time transactions inside Hadoop right now? No, absolutely not. Would I do batch processing up to the five-minute period or something like this? Yes, absolutely. Does that answer the question? So remember, a, a Hadoop cluster, by default, will always replicate three nodes. So it takes a piece of data for these three computers, and it puts that piece of data on each one, and then does work on them and brings them back. If one of them fails, if this computer dies, the hard drive, whatever, it picks up another node and does it again. Okay? That's how it keeps its redundancy, no matter what. So they don't fail too terribly often. Or if you fail a node, they're not worried about it. That's why the Facebook you know, one building cluster can work if, excuse me, if they lose, you know, 10 nodes inside that cluster, who cares? It's just going to keep replicating to its other places, okay? All right, so highly scalable, less cost. We had no licensing costs on either of these two, and all we basically paid for was hardware. Paid about $100,000 for hardware, essentially, um, you know, and that varies depending on boxes, all sorts of things like that. A lot of people talk about putting Hadoop on commodity hardware, and that's where the redundancy comes in. I completely agree, but at the same time, you need to make sure you have the performance you need. So don't just go out and buy these boxes or something for a production cluster. Buy decent boxes that work and that have maintenance and that sort of thing, because you're still going to need to replace them. You know, you still want to spend that cost. So no licensing, and we got that all in place. Very quick for the data access. So by putting the speed layer in place, the elastic search, like I said, we cut our query times down to 50 milliseconds, every once in a while 100 milliseconds, things like that, instead of a five-minute query. We also, what I'm working for is making a smaller SQL Server. SQL Server have a lot of costs with it. The bigger you get, the more Enterprise Edition you have to buy, the more costs we expend. So the more I can get this to move data into here, the the more I can shrink my SQL Server, and that's my goal. So, all right. So, any other questions on the solution? Like I said, we can still go over it um, in more detail, but let's talk about some of the what's next things too. All right. So, what's next? Not only for us, but for big data in general. Everyone's talking about real time. <laughs> okay. So, the first lesson in data warehousing about real time is that real time does not exist. That simple. 99% of the companies, if you said, what is real time, they'll probably say, well, I want it right now. Well, no, they'll probably say, well, I want it about five minutes. Because if you say, I want it right now, they better get a blank checkout and start writing. <laughs> because real time, right now, immediately, is very, very expensive. It's not just about the database. It's not just about the data you have behind it. It's about your processes. It's about your computers. It's about your operations. It's everything. Okay. So keep in mind, when people say real time, they typically mean a couple minutes delayed. But it is where everybody is moving to. Everyone wants to do real time big data projects. All right? You'll hear about it all the time. Big data. Now, this is where the size actually does come in. We've all heard of the Internet of Things. Everything's getting bigger. I put up this Fitbit picture right here. These things are storing tons of tons of data all the time. We all have devices, phones, everything else. Everything is storing more and more data. So when I say my company only has one terabyte or 800 gigs, I fully expect a lot of the companies and a lot of the devices for you to work in terabyte ranges is the common. Petabytes will be common very, very soon. In just a couple years, most things out there will be talking in petabytes just because everything is collecting data. And the rule of it is that you don't throw anything away because you may not have the ability to process it right now, but you can do it later. That's another great usage for Hadoop. A lot of people are using Hadoop to store massive amounts of data and then process it at a later time because Hadoop is very, very cheap storage, okay? Much cheaper than, say, a SAN or a large network device. All right, the costs are going down. The costs are going down because of my original slide where I said we failed. 
Five or six years ago, everybody was talking about business intelligence. They were all talking about data warehousing. They were all talking about the Kimball method. And those things brought on huge costs, lots of time, took forever. Now, all we talk about is how to throw it into Hadoop, how to use Elasticsearch, how to use Cassandra or React or something else, and everything, the cost is going down, not up. So it's making it more and more easy to get to data. So as you move forward, there's going to be lots and lots of chances to get very low-cost systems in place that can handle lots and lots of data. Yes, sir? Uh, can you compare uh, the Elasticsearch to the measure model and how you might change to, uh, to the Elasticsearch in order to uh, facilitate a change in, in Mindset? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, just any type of query. Because I feel like in this class we're, we're at least getting a, a, a good understanding of what dimensional modeling is. Yep. But if we really are learning ancient stuff, it would be really nice to, to draw some parallels so that we could understand, um, you know. It, so, yes. So to answer the question, how can I you talk about dimensional modeling versus, say, Elasticsearch or some new key value pair set or something like that? So the way I've done this in the past is that it all comes down to pieces of data. Right now, my common thing as a DBA is to look at everything in sets. I can't think of running a query against one million rows and doing it row by row, row by agonizing row. Nobody wants to do that. In dimensional modeling, you take the data, you go by row, and then you put it into all of its little pieces that it belongs to. Elasticsearch, open source, all of these things are doing the same thing. They're just using different tools that do it much faster. So um, let's take this, for example, right here. We, in this table, have a nice wide table, a staging table, a denormalized table, just like you have in any staging data warehousing project. And normally, you would take that data, you would go over to your dimensional cube, your dimensional model, and you would put all of the pieces into their place with SSIS or something else. You would grab the data from here, you would go and look up all the pieces, and then you would insert a row. This ETL is doing the same thing. It's just doing it across 30 machines, or however many machines you have. So instead of having one piece out there doing that lookup, and lookup, and lookup, and lookup, you have 30 machines doing the lookup, and multiples doing the lookup. And then when it comes back to here, it's in one piece again. Does that help to explain it a little bit? No? Confusing? It's just I can I can very clearly see uh, in dimensional modeling the ETL, and I can actually see you know a name for example. I can see that name almost go through the entire process, right. see where it starts and see where it ends, and it makes perfect sense to me. Whereas this, uh, it ends up as a property of the data. So you think of it as like a key. If you have a name. What, what is your key? Let's say you have a customer ID, and you have a name that goes with that customer, right? In this system, you would have a customer ID right there. You'd have a value or a property that says name, and then you would have a value that actually says their name. So that's a vertical key value pair. So you would have that key repeated over and over and over again, customer 1111111, all the way down. And then you would have all the properties, name, address, phone, city, state, zip, all those things. You'd have all the values in that. It's a very large vertical table instead of a horizontal method. There's no schema about it. It's just a large piece of data. So when you say it's easier to design and put something in that would be faster than it would in a search It is 110% easier to design. Now, that doesn't make it better because people usually will take shortcuts in the design. They say we don't need to design it. What you're going to hear a lot in open source and, and big data projects is we don't need schema. We have a schema-less design, meaning they threw it all into a vertical store or something like that. Let me tell you, you still need some sort of schema to understand your data. Not Just having no schema whatsoever, you're just throwing out data all over the world. But if you have some sort of schema, like a vertical key-value pair, you can see exactly what that is. Customer ID going down, the property that is there, and then the value. And that would be a way to express that. Did that answer your question a little bit? Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Sorry. Okay, so we'll say that, um, as an example, so that was a really good explanation. Thanks. Um, taking it one more step. So if I wanted a really simple query is going to be sales by customer for 
You have to go for January or whatever. Can you explain? Uh, like I said, in, in dimensional modeling, I can very clearly see what the table would look, how it started, how it ends. How it, can you explain that in using? Yes. So let me. Uh, oh, no whiteboard markers. Really? Let me. Uh, I was going to say I could probably draw on PowerPoint, but my mouse PowerPoint drawing would be horrible. And this will be a little hard to see, so I apologize. But let's say once again we have, and I'm just going to use customer name and city. Oh, sorry, this is customer ID. One, two, three. John, Matt, Fred, SLC, AF, uh, Pro. Okay, so standard normalized data. I mean, there should be more tables, whatever. This is a denormalized table. It's all sitting there ready to go. This moves into a vertical like this. So what you would have is you'd have key, and I'll move in a second so you can see this. You'd have property, then you'd have value. How many people in here are programmers? Only a couple that I'll admit it, okay. Um, so you got name. And then you've got city. I guess I didn't need the next one. You've got path. You got American Fork. And then you'd have two. Or I'm sorry, I labeled this one, didn't I? Let me fix that. So make sure this is right. John. Uh, he has SLC on one. This is path. Or no. Ah. Okay, I'm just going to do those for now. So, how do these turn into something that's really searchable or good? Because if you think about this, this is a longer query in SQL. You, in this table, this easily we become millions and millions of rows. Okay, these get very, very big. So, why is this better? Why does this system help it? Because when you load it into Elasticsearch, it doesn't stay like this. It becomes documents. So once again you have an ID, and that's one. But then you have properties. Those properties are name, city, and once again they have the same information. Then you have another document. Properties. Name, city, put it in yeah. Now, what the tools like Elasticsearch and others do is they can search documents extremely fast because they're all in memory. They're all basically stored as objects inside that memory. And they have methods to search for things like name or city. By putting them into these documents, it's a form that it knows and understands and it can search that much faster. That's the difference kind of between the dimensional model and where it is, where it is before. I mean, where it becomes. I've got several hands, so hold on one second. Let's go up front. Yes? Do you just go one step further and say you have a product table coming from your relational database? Uh-huh. Um, and you have a product key. Mm -hmm. How does study translate into those documents? You'd have the same thing. It would be nothing more than a property of that product. Let's say product. We'll give this a Fitbit. You would say product here. And say pip it. And so then you would have product, and then it would show up in here mm -hmm. as product. So it's like one table and those are all attributes. Correct. Think of, again, the hard part to understand about any of these pieces is you can't think of the data, you must think of it in pieces. Properties of the data. Everything is a property of the data. You are classifying it, it's metadata, you are telling it what it is. That's how you figure it out into a document store. Now, hopefully someone recognized that I'm breaking rules here. I'm duplicating data. I'm duplicating it. I'm making more copies of it. I'm breaking all of those rules. But it's still faster because of the tools have changed the way we look at that. So it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means it's a different way of doing it by breaking the rules to do that. OK, I had another question up there. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so in a way, yes. The properties column is very much, it's hard to say schema. I mean, I would say it's metadata 
it's classifying the data that you're talking about. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, there was another question over here. When is, when is ever is a data warehouse what? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. When is it justifiable? Okay, so when is a data warehouse justifiable? Um, wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'm saying that's a tough one because there's so many different definitions of data warehouse in the world, it's hard to say one. I would say a data warehouse is justifiable when a company has a reporting problem that needs to be resolved. In other words, if you have a database that only does writes and never needs to be queried, you don't need a data warehouse. But if you need it to be queried and you need it to be cost effective and fast and scalable, you should probably look into some sort of reporting solution. Whether that's a data warehouse, whether that's something like this, whether that's copying your database to a drive and carrying it somewhere else. Whatever that may be, you need to do that based off of those ideas. It needs to be queried, it needs to be fast, and it needs to be scalable. That's what I would look for in those. Does that answer the question? Okay, did I have somebody else over here? Yes, sir. Say, I mean, say you have that in like a big object uh, ray. How, where does the indexing and the speed and the switch come Is it just... If you have this in an object array. Yeah. So that's where Elasticsearch stores these as documents. And it searches for documents. So in a way, it is doing that. And that's what it's putting inside Elasticsearch. So I can't give you the internals of what Elasticsearch is doing to make that fast. I honestly don't know. But by putting it into documents, that's what it's designed to search up. I would go to them, look them up some more, and find out why. Again, it's based off Lucene and Solar. They will do the same thing. Any document store will be similar in nature to what it's doing. I thought I had one more over here. Oh, yes. Can you virtualize the do? OK, so our original test systems were virtual. They were actually just virtual machines to get up running testing. So virtual works just fine, but Hadoop does love its own computers. And here's why. Hadoop kind of breaks the rules also. Everybody knows what a SAN is, right? Storage area network, large, huge thing of disks that's really smart, that gives you lots of performance. Hadoop does not like these. It does not like RAID, and it does not like SAN. What it does is it takes each and every hard drive in the computer and puts the files across it itself. It's called an array of just a bunch of disks, a JBOD. So by making that a bunch of disks, it makes it very fast. So you can virtualize something like Hadoop, but if it all goes back to one big SAN where you're virtualizing it, you're not really gaining all the performance benefit you can from something like Hadoop. You could. Yeah, that would be helpful. But again, so a typical Hadoop node, so SQL Server, you have a connection, you store a disk on some SAN, you have two or three of those mapped out as drives. Hadoop typically will have five or six drives inside one box. All those files are put across different pieces of that box by Hadoop. So in other words, it handles all of that part of it. So Hadoop very much is its own SAN by doing that. So if you, if you say, here's your virtual disk, and there's 100 disks behind it, but you only give it one, you're kind of cutting it off at the knees. Does that make sense? So now, does that mean that you can't do virtual? No, absolutely not. You can completely do virtual. Um, best example in the world, Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services has MapReduce right now. I guarantee you they're doing virtual. They may have Hadoop clusters out there, but I guarantee you they're virtual machines hanging around. So yes, you can absolutely do virtual. Um, sooner or later, most people suggest going to physical boxes with Hadoop. Uh, we have gone to physical boxes. We used virtual for testing, but after that, we went to physical. OK, other questions? OK. Let's see what else I had on the end here. OK, so other parts of cost going down. Machine learning and predictive models. This little picture here may look like horrible, and it's one of the horrible uh, pictures that, that uh, one of our groups created. But it's a really, really interesting thing. So a couple months ago, we started a competition on big data, and we told Health Equity and Skull Candy, they said, we'll give you data. We'll give you money and prize money and stuff like that. We'll give you data, and you have the community work on it. So the question to ask in Health Equity is they gave us a bunch of their customer data, 
all taken away of customer names and things like that. But they gave us a bunch of their data and said, we need to know when our customers need to put money in their accounts. They are a health savings organization, HSA, and you put money into an account that you can use later on. They asked us, how do we know when to put money into our accounts? This was one of the predictive models one of our teams came up with. This is every medical code that is done to all of the customers that is in their system. They gave us three or 400,000 customers. And it went out and it said, OK, here's all the different procedures you've had done. And based on these procedures, here's a grouping that looks like if you have this procedure done, you could have these procedures done as well. And by finding these groupings right here, they could then say, OK, we have a feeling that with this age and this grouping and you have this procedure done, you probably need to put money into your account because you're about to have all these things done to you as well. And they were able to predict whether or not that was true. Of course, there was outliers. <laughs> there was one that found that somebody had toe surgery and then it said, well, you need to put $100,000 into your account. And like, Why? You had toe surgery. Well, the next procedure the person had was brain surgery. So it had predicted that anybody that had toe surgery would also have brain surgery, <laughs> which wasn't, of course, the case. But the point of this method is that the machine learning, the predictive models that are going on are amazing. What we're doing right now with air quality is going to be really, really cool to show where air quality is going to come up, where there's going to be problems. And a lot of it is based off of this. And the way these guys do this is they take pieces of data, they throw it into MapReduce and, and AWS, and they get answers like this out of it. So that's really where things are going with the data scientists, the analysts. They're moving more and more to predicting these things. Yes, sir? I have a wonderful slide on it in just a second. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Any other questions on what's going forward in the future? What, has anybody else heard of things that you would like to add to it as well? I mean, I'm knee deep in this stuff all the time, but I'm also head down on my work that I have to do, so I don't see all of these things. But to me, what we've seen is this machine learning and this predictive models, because as this data gets bigger, as we get 30 petabytes in a standard company, people want to know what they can do with the data. And that all comes down to this. It really comes down to what models can you create? How can you see the data? How can you find the data? That's the key part. Because having a bunch of data sitting around does you no good. You have to use the data. So any questions? OK. Air quality. So basically, this is the end of the normal presentation. But I will talk about the air quality and everything else going on. <laughs> so we'll talk about the community and things going on. But if you have any more questions about the other side, please feel free to ask as well. OK. Um, air quality, bigdataUtah.org. What we have done is we've gotten together as a community, the UHUG users group, Utah Geek Events, the SQL Server users group, and we've said we're going to collect as much data about air quality as we can, and then at the end of the summer, we're going to give it to everyone, and they're going to compete on how to improve the air quality in Utah. Now, when I say in Utah, I mean primarily the Salt Lake City Valley. We're all sick of eating pea soup during the wintertime, so that's where we're really focusing our time, but we're leaving it open. And the whole idea is that all summer long, we're holding this every Friday at the Leonardo, except for this Friday. It's at Black Diamond. Um, <laughs> I just sent out a newsletter on that. Every Friday at 10 o'clock, we have kind of a stand-up meeting. We tell you what data sets are out there. We then also give trainings on what you can do to find data. Find it, collect it, clean it, analyze it. These will all be topics that we will be training on and talking about over the next 10 weeks. Um, one second. Once those 10 weeks are done, we'll break into teams, whatever teams we want, and we'll actually compete on all the data we just collected. Okay? So we may end up with terabytes of data for you to compare, things that you can put predictive analytics against, predictive models, all sorts of things. And if you have an idea, like you think that air quality would be better if everyone rode a bike, bike every day, you can probably find a way to prove it with all of this data. I mean, that's the point of the competition. Yes, sir. Uh, did I say 10 o'clock for the, um, Leonardo? Sorry, noon. Did I say 10 o'clock? I'm sorry, noon. Every day at lunch, essentially. I mean, every Friday at noon. And then, like I said, this website has all of the videos we've done so far. We've had lots of great presentations, how to find data 
that's out there on a website and pull it down with you know, Python and scripts. So even if you've got data out there, you can find it and you can collect it just with simple scripts to do that. And all of those videos are up there on Big Data Utah. Um, they're at a link at a Google account. But the whole idea is that the first 10 weeks is all cooperation. Everybody working together, everybody learning, everybody collecting data, and then at the end, we actually compete for prizes and fame and glory and all those sort of things. So, yes, sir. Did you have a question? I thought you were right. <laughs> so, and the whole goal being improve the air quality of Utah. Now, the key to this is that everything you do must be open source. So every piece of data you collect must be able to go back to the source. We have a civic open data site. So once you collect it, clean it, you'll put it back onto that site, and everybody can use it. Every code that you write has to be open source. And when we get to the competition phase, if you create the world's greatest predictive model and you do that, it has to be open source that everybody else can benefit from. That's our goal is to build the community and make sure everyone benefits from the work that is being done. So yes? So you say that you're having meetings to discuss different ways to talk about the Yep. Are you talking to me about the Next week. <laughs> yeah, we've got, um, we are working on it for this week. We've got Matt Lammers from right here at the U that runs the Meso West data. And then we have Bryce Bird from the state of Utah that runs the Department of Air Quality or part of the Department of Air Quality. And they're going to teach us about what we need to look for in air quality data because we don't know. I don't even still know what PM 2.5 is and stuff like that. So, but so that they can help us understand what we should be looking for. So they're going to be there next week, and then towards the end, we're going to bring them back, and they're going to talk about some of the things they see or what they should, what you should look to predict in the future. So we are definitely going to get them involved. But when it comes down to collecting and cleaning data, it's collecting and cleaning data. I mean, all data is somewhat similar in what needs to be done. So I would definitely suggest everybody be involved. And my one tip for everyone, no matter what, is be involved with your community. As you're here in school right now, there's no greater benefit you can get than being involved with your community. The events we put on, the things we do, because these are the people that you're going to get hired from later on. Okay? The more you know them, the better you know them, the better chance you'll have. Uh, the other thing I don't have up here yet is October 25th. Mark that in your calendars. Right here in this building, we'll have our second Big Mountain Data Conference. The Big Mountain Data Conference is a mixture of SQL Saturday and Big Data. And all we're going to talk about all day long is data technologies. ETL, data warehousing, NoSQL, SQL Server, Oracle, everything to do with it. We'll have 10 concurrent tracks going on all day long, and it's all absolutely free right here. So October 25th, you do not want to miss that. There's no registration for that yet because I haven't created it. <laughs> it was only about three days ago.